purpose to it, they are going to get bored and they're going to look for that. Eventually they're going to look for that. Okay, so this is uh, one of Henry Ford's quotes that I thought I'd share with you that says a lot about his business philosophy. There is, there is one rule for the industrials. Make the best quality goods possible at the lowest cost possible, paying the highest wages possible. That was one of the tough lessons that he learned when he created the Ford Motor Company early on. Okay, let's go 50 years. Um, 50 years later, I'm sorry, we should actually be in the 60s. Let's pretend we're in 1967. The CEO was a prime minister. Do you, are you familiar with any of these leaders and their companies? I would think, right? Everybody know Great Rock? What company? McDonald's. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we talk about now the CEO is more of a prime minister. Back in the Ford day, it was pretty much the way that the CEO, the owners, wanted things run, right? Now, now the CEO has become a little bit more enlightened, and we're calling him a prime minister. These brands are becoming uh, more global. And now when you think about the 60s, yeah, not only do you have radio, you have television, and you have advertising, and all that goes with that. So what can we learn from somebody like... Sam Walton. Sam Walton came up with the, the quote, this is how he ran his business, there is only one boss, and that boss is the customer. And the rest of that quote goes, is the customer, should they decide to no longer do business with you, that Sam himself, everybody from the chairman of the board, right on down through the company, will lose their jobs. So when you really think about it in any business, it's really the customer that decides what we as employees or managers or leaders, how successful we're going to be. Okay, 10 rules of Sam Walton. Does everyone Let's know who Sam Walton is? Walmart? Okay. Sure. Sam Walton, here's a uh, question for all of you. Which of these 10 rules of Sam that made him so successful apply today? Let's start with uh, number one, commit to your business. How important is that to you, starting and running your business in the future, to being successful? Why else would you be there? It's no relevant? Why else yeah. would you be in the business if you weren't committed to it? Well, that's a good point, but um, I, I think what he's, what he's basically saying is you're, you're literally passionate about yeah. that, right? right? If you might want to be there, why would you focus on it? Okay, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you a good example of, of what we mean by commitment. Henry Ford, the Ford Motor Company was his third try. His first two businesses that he was involved in failed. And that happens to a lot of entrepreneurs, right? So the more you read about starting your own business, there's a, there's a good chance that the business that you start may fail. And there's an even better chance that the business that you start will not look exactly like the thought it's going to look, even if it is successful. So it's that passionate commitment to your business that he's talking about. Okay, treat your associates as partners. Your associates, and by the way, that's the, that's the term that Sam would use with the people that work for him. Instead of calling them employees, you know, it's, it's a more ennobling, motivating way of referring to people that work with you for you as associates. Is that still a plot? Okay. Uh, motivate your partners. I think we would go down the list and we would agree that every one of these rules from Sam Walton would apply to the business today. Which ones would you move up in terms of t Sam's list? Are there any that you would move up? The bottom one? The very bottom one. Swim upstream? And why would you move that up? Because I feel like it goes hand in hand with the commitment to your business. I think that it's extremely important for an entrepreneur to be passionate about what they're doing, and if they're not, they're going to fail. Agreed. Would anybody else move um, one of them up to the top three? Uh, number eight, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, exceed your customer's expectation. I feel mm -hmm. like, especially in like today's culture, uh, you're looking for that customer loyalty. Uh, so exceeding their expectations, they're more likely to stick with you, not just tomorrow, but for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, I think like today that's more important than it was back in the 60s. 
That's a good point. Very good point. What would you add to the list? What, we, what is missing? From the list to be successful in today's business environment. <clears throat> Sustainably, mm -hmm. something along the lines of thinking sustainably, so uh, kind of benefits the environment as well. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, um, you know, uh, kids our age are looking for companies that are thinking green and actually like supporting them. Mm. So, good one. good one. Okay, what else would you put on it? If you were starting a company and you had your, your own list, what would ladies? Let's get some ladies talking here. It's the whole idea. We want to make this a diverse. Inclusive conversation. So, what else would be up there from the from a female leader's perspective? What else would you have up there? Remember, Sam started his company back in the early '60s. So, 50 years ago, things have changed. What's nice is that you probably would agree that these men are a really good starting point. But when you really think about trying to relate to all of you going forward. There's probably some other ideas that you have that aren't up there. What about like volunteering in the community? Hmm, I love that one. Like charity work. Yeah, like yeah. That's what attracted me to Angela. The fact that she was she was involved in running a not-for-profit. I thought this was an area that I'd really like to get to know people in that space. Yeah, great idea, great point. Okay. Good ideas. So here we are now, off the chart. Forget about the uh, the arrow. <laughs> Um, but we're, we're in uh, this year, the CEO now is an agile lead. So we all know who Jeff Bezos is, right? We all use Amazon. Mary Barrett, she is the general, um, the CEO of General Motors for the last two years. First female CEO of a major auto company. She's trying to reinvent GM, we'll get into that in a minute. Jeff Wiener. LinkedIn. LinkedIn, thank you, thank you. Okay, very, very successful CEO of LinkedIn. Okay, so let's talk a little bit and think about um, Mary Bowers. This is her path to becoming CEO of General Motors. So take a look at that. And again, let's try to make this interactive. Share with everybody what jumps out at you in terms of her path. Where she started at. Yeah. I'm going to get... Oh, this way again here. Go ahead. Where she started. I think she started as a fan engineer at 18. Yeah. She usually, so she's probably, that's probably before like when we would have been in like the car industry at when she was 18. Right. Good point. Now, just the way I heard her father worked for GM as well. So, and, and the only reason I bring that up is so she had an understanding of the business through him and um, obviously had. A good understanding of what General Motors was all about. And General Motors, actually, just just a uh, quick quick history tape where where Henry Ford didn't see the future coming. He did a great job figuring out the assembly line problem, being uh, very very successful early on. But Henry Ford was so adamant about producing cars of one color, black back then, that despite the best efforts of his leadership team, saying, "Hey, Henry." You know, we we got to we got to start rolling out different models, different colors, et cetera, et cetera. He wouldn't go there because that would disrupt what was being so successful for him. General Motors back then was the company that first started doing that, or one of the companies that first started introducing colors to their um, their early automobiles, and that attracted all the people like us that you know I just don't want to have a phone or a laptop that looks like everybody else's. I want mine to be somewhat distinctive, and that's how color came into the automobile industry, but that wasn't through Ford. That was actually through General Motors and other companies. Here's something that jumps out to me is um, 2009, Head of Human Resources. So remember, we were talking about Ford's challenges with his assembly line employees, right? Well, he, he basically figured out, okay, to get the right people in here and to keep them longer working, I gotta pay them more. And that actually worked to his benefit. In that case study, not only did they make more, but the company made more because of increased productivity. So it was, it was a win all around for Henry Ford, his workers, and they, they were actually able to start affording cars. That was a, um, a group, a market that automobile manufacturers didn't think they could tap into. They didn't think they'd get the cost of their automobile low enough 
and that the workers could make enough money to afford cars, but Henry Ford was able to make that happen. But here you talk, here you talk about somebody in Mary that was obviously, even after getting an MBA, she decided, you know, um, gave me an opportunity to work and run head of human resources. Let's give that a shot. Everything that Mary Barra has done in her career at General Motors, she, she says this, she has known. No matter she does it willingly, she's a team player, and she's going to give that job the best she can do every day. She's fully engaged. So you can see where that took her, took her from head of human resources to head of product development, and now she's the CEO, successful CEO of General Motors. Here's uh, Mary talked about the future. I believe the auto industry will change more in the next five to ten years than it has in the past 50. Wow. It's changed a lot in the last 50, certainly the last 100, but even the last 50. And she's saying in the next five to ten years, it's going to change even more. Well, they're going to be driving themselves, right? Yeah. I think not. Nice. So if you're Mary, and she's doing this now, what are you doing at GM to be prepared for the future? If you're the next Mary, or the next Henry, in the automobile industry, all right, what are you doing now to give you a better chance to compete five, ten years ago, let alone 50? I would be keeping up with all the technological advances that are happening. Right. And it's a huge, huge part of the automotive industry. Like you said, we're driving ourselves <coughs> in the next couple of years. Like, it's just going to be out of this world in the next five, ten years. So keeping in tune with that is even better. Exactly right. What Mary's doing is she's disrupting General Motors, their, their business model now, so that they won't miss the future. So they, they're not involved with Uber, but they're involved with a company, a competitor to Uber's Lyft, yep. and they have purchased an equity interest in Lyft so that they have an understand just where that business model is going to take the automobile industry in the future. And they're, they're literally getting involved in the buying or, or investing money, creating a partnership with technology companies that are disrupting the automobile space. Very, very, very smart. And that's coming from a woman. So I applaud all of you. I think she's probably um, talking to this age group to find out what do they want in a car, right? And I guess mm -hmm. focus groups are probably going crazy with 18 to 25-year-olds, I would say. That's what I would do if I was a CEO. What do you guys want? I mean, that's probably how Uber came up. Well, we don't really want to drive. We don't like to drive. We like to be, you know, and I'm sure that's where it came from. But yeah, you've got to know who the next generation is. That's why everyone's always so interested in you guys. You know, they just want to know you're the future. You know, it's kind of a cliche term, but it's true. If you're a business guy, you know you're going to be buying. What do you guys want? You know, so make your voices heard. Let them know what you want. Well, let's say it, Angela. Okay, I'm going to leave you with a quote <clears throat> that I think says a lot about Mary and why she is successful and I believe will be going forward. If we win the hearts and minds of our employees, we'll have a better business success. Okay? So this kind of takes that enlightened leadership that didn't necessarily exist back in um, the early 1900s anyway. And she realizes that to be successful in the future, she's really got to tap into your, not only your minds, but your hearts as a leader, and that's where that tenure she spent as the head of human resources is going to help her because she got to realize what, what's on everybody's mind, you know, in, in the company's size of General Motors. So I, I think she, she will be successful. Keep an eye on her and that company going forward. Okay, so we're, we're about to roll into the next part of this program, and let's just talk about problem solving. So we saw that, obviously, in Henry Ford, and we see that in, in Mary Barra, and everybody in between. Every successful CEO in the course of the last hundred years has put together a good team of problem solvers. But this quote, what we like about this quote is it talks about how important that is going forward. Today, the economy has become more diverse and competitive. We all know that. And since the pace of change is relentless, it's an economy that rewards creative problem solvers. Okay? So what are those problems? The leadership challenges that lie ahead for, for all of us, including people your age. Let's start with the first one. The first challenge, only 35% of U.S. managers are fully engaged in their jobs. That's based upon Gallup research. Only 35% of U.S. managers are fully engaged in their jobs. 
Why is that so? Work smart, not hard. Work smart, not hard. I mean, I think that's what most individuals believe that they can get the right person to run their company. They don't have to do work, and they can just get back and put the money back in. So why would that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I would think the same. No, way. no, no. Everything, everything, everything's good. By the way, when we're talking about managers now, we're not necessarily talking about just CEO, right? So th this is not just at the CEO level. These are managers within the company, right? And, but, but good, good point. Um, I think their priorities and interests are different. Um, for example, my store director, when I saw that J Crew, she was the store director, but she runs from blog and blog channel and she like fully invests her time in that and doesn't have like doesn't dedicate as much time to the company. So I think a lot of managers are trying to do things that like fulfill their interests and hobbies and things that will bring them like instant gratification or like see improvement amongst themselves rather than doing something for a job that they're not gonna get that much out of except for like a paycheck. I think that they're overworked. I think that managers are typically working um, the most hours of any of the employees and it runs them dry and so they're just doing what they need to do to do their job. Good point. Very good point. What else? What else do you think? Why that's the case? Well, what Gallup research has revealed and it, it ties to what everybody said here. Um, first of all, there's not a lot of people in the workforce, in the population, that have the innate skill set to be a good manager. It's like, it's like any other skill set, right? Not everybody is going to be a great athlete, not everybody's going to be a great musician, not everybody's going to be a great manager. So what happens too often, according to Gallup Research, is that people get promoted or moved into management positions that aren't necessarily the best fit to become a manager. You know, I, my background in uh, media early on was sales. So what typically happens in the sales arena is you take the, the top biller and make the top biller the next sales manager. But that's not always the best fit for being a sales manager, right? Because the top biller is usually highly, highly motivated, but highly, highly self-motivated, right? It's, it's kind of all about me. But the manager, you're looking at the manager, you're looking for somebody that's not just motivating themselves, you're motivating that entire sales team, right? That's just different personality. So you come to work every day, and you're not as motivated as I'd like you to be, right? i got to figure out a way to engage you, you know, authentically, and realize that not having a good day, but my job as manager is I, I'm going to try to figure out, okay, what's up and, and let's talk about it, or maybe somebody's not making their budgets. And this is, this is a whole other skill set. So the first thing that, that's happening is that we're not putting the right people in that position. The other thing that kind of dovetails into that, the skill set that you need in a really good manager, more female, more women have that, those skills than men. Okay, this is not me talking, but I do, I have seen it. Okay, this is what research has proven. So there's a certain amount of uh, what they call emotional intelligence. You've heard the term emotional intelligence, right? It's becoming more and more important in, in the business world. So one thing, you know, IQ is measuring just how natively bright someone is. EQ, emotional intelligence, is more how does that person utilize their own emotions to make them more effective in their role, especially if they're a manager. In other words, and realize that everybody has emotions. Everybody does, right? So just bossing somebody, telling somebody to do something, is not really an effective way of managing somebody. You've got to get beyond that. You've got to use your emotional intelligence. You've got to find a way to inspire people. And that's not easy to do. So the problem with this is what they call Gallup calls the cascade effect. So if you have disengaged managers, what's happening with the employees that they're managing? Well, it gets worse. So here's challenge number two. So remember, 35% of managers are fully, only 35% are fully engaged, 
right? And again, let's just talk about the term engagement. Now. So, what we mean by engagement, three out of 10 employees are fully engaged. That means that when they wake up in the morning, they look forward to going to work for several reasons. One, the manager, the manager typically cares about them. The manager in the company cares about them. They're not just a number. They're not just somebody that has to do that job. There is really like, there's empathy there. There's real feeling there. Um, they also, we all have our individual strengths, right? They feel like when they go to work that the job they're doing taps into their talents and their strengths. So what they were kind of born to do, for the most part, they're doing every day. They're tapping into that. And that that's that meaning part of the job that's going to be important to you as you, as you go forward in your careers. Um, and then the third part is the purpose of the company. It's like Angela was talking about earlier about, and this is what, you know, this whole class is really talking about ethics and values, core values, etc. What you may find, and I think you will find in your career, is that one thing is moving up in your career because you want, you know, you want more money, you want a better title, more responsibility, you're literally building a career, I get that. But at the same time, what you want to remember is that the core values are going to be an important part of, of that equation for you as you get further on in your life and your careers. You're going to start realizing more and more who you are as a person, what's important to you, you're going to be looking for not just managers, but companies that, that tie into your core values. So that's what it means to be fully engaged, and maybe that's why we're only looking at three out of 10 employees are fully engaged, because that's hard to find. You don't see that in a lot of companies, but it's important. So employee engagement is strongly connected to an organization's financial success. So let's just say all of you one day will either be running teams, running companies, starting your own business. You don't want to have three out of ten of your employees fully engaged, right? You want more than that. How are you going to be successful at three out of ten? And that's, that's Gallup, by the way, does this every year. And those numbers don't change even over a decade. They're, they're pretty much about three out of ten. So... How are you going to do that? Your financial success of your organization is, is, is based upon the success of you hiring, retaining, and motivating your people. Okay, so let's move on to challenge number three. You all are consumers, right? 86% of buyers will pay more for a better customer experience. All right, anybody here, I'm sure, anybody here like Apple products? I should get almost... Everybody raising their hands, but let's just say that, okay, here we go. Getting people to bring up Apple, people starting to get a little bit more lively. Look at this, I see the logos, okay. So you buy Apple products because it's the cheapest on the market, right? No. <laughs> I'm wrong on that. Okay, so why do you buy Apple products? Um, I buy them for the quality, and I buy them because of... Um, the connection that they provide between each device. Like I have a phone, I have an iPad, and I have a MacBook, and they all are connected. Okay. Sorry. Oh, no one here. I thought I was losing you. <laughs> Good news. He's staying. Okay. Who else? Who else? Who else buys um, Apple products above and beyond price? Because um, they also have like um, more the latest technology, like uh, my phone connected to my laptop and, you know, and they can sync and then also um, more reliable. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. other people's opinions are different about that, but, you know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I can go and just be like, oh, this isn't working. Right. So, so, um, well, let me finish let me, let me finish this sequence because the next part is kind of important. And we are going to talk a little bit more about Apple and why they're so successful. But, um, so 86% of buyers will pay more for better customer experience is basically what we're saying from many of you is that Apple provides that for the most part, right? Okay, so the question, <clears throat> what percent of those customers feel that vendors consistently meet their expectations, right? 86% said, I'll pay you more if you do a great job consistently. That customer experience is, is awesome consistently. I'll pay you more. Now, this is the follow-up question, all right? What percent are actually walking the talk? 
vendors, okay, are actually delivering that, meeting their expectations? 46. 20. You're going to be as shocked as I was when I saw this figure, okay? 5%. 1%. How much? 1. Okay, were you here for this presentation before? No. Very good. What? Very good. Shocking. Yeah. Shocking, right? And I think, I think, I, I looked this up, by the way, after reading it, I said, just, I, I just can't believe that. I got to look at the research again, I looked at the research again, and, and the numbers don't change. But I think, I think what we're saying here is the term consistently, you know? And that's what Henry Ford, by the way. Does like, this mean expectations of their products or their customer service? It would be the entire experience. Okay. Yeah, the customer journey. Yeah, yeah. that's a good question. That's a great question. Customer journey. The reason why I'm asking is because it, it kind of makes sense because like different people have different um, expectations and experiences. Like even when it delivers customer service or like their products or something like that. So right. you're not happy with one aspect of your business, you can be unhappy and satisfied with the other one. It does say that it means your expectations. Right. So. What I'm sharing with you, whether the one percent is, it is accurate based upon the research they did. But let's say when we do research, you're working with a, a, a sample, right? So maybe if you did use another sample, the one percent would go up to let's just say five percent, ten percent. But the point is that there's a disconnect that exists in, 